Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, now, as you know, our, our, our speaker today was meant to be Professor Peter Dean from the United States uh, Study Centre, who is one of the architects of the Defence Strategic Review. Um, unfortunately, and I say most apologetically, at, at very short notice, uh, Professor Dean had to postpone his lecture, but he has offered to, uh, to speak to us next year, and we'll, we'll take him up on, on that, that, that offer. Um, very fortunately for us, um, Aaron Patrick, uh, who was due to deliver the Sir Herman Black Memorial Lecture in a fortnight's time, um, was available and uh, uh, to deliver the Sir Herman Black Lecture. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate that he's been able to, and very delighted uh, he's been able to come to bring that lecture forward. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2023 Sir Herman Black Memorial Lecture, the year in review. <clears throat> a few things about Sir Herman Black. Sir Herman Black, um, AC, who graduated with first class honours and the University Medal in Economics from the University of Sydney in 1927, taught economics at the university from 1932 to 1969 and was the university's chancellor from 1970 to 1990. He studied foreign and economic policy as a Rockefeller uh, Foundation Fellow in the United States and in Europe um, from 1936 to 1938, working mainly at Harvard University and at the State Department in Washington in 1951. He was particularly interested in the application of economic theory to practical issues and was an exceptionally talented um, orator. Indeed, uh, radio broadcasting as a news commentator for the Australian Broadcasting Commission made H.D. Black, uh, in, at, at the time, a household name. <clears throat> when he was the university's chancellor, each November he addressed our institute uh, entitling his lecture, The Year in Review. Um, and in it he, he examined the year's key strategic events and their implications for Australia. We have continued that tradition and honour his name, ending our monthly lecture series at the end of each year with the Sir Herman Black Memorial Lecture, The Year in Review. Um, I'll now hand over to our Vice President and our Events Coordinator, Ron Lyons, to introduce um, Aaron Patrick and invite him to deliver the 2023 Sir Herman Black Memorial Lecture, The Year in Review. Thanks, Kim. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last of our lecture series for 2023. As Kim said, the Sir Herman Black Memorial Lecture, The Year in Review, and it'll be presented by Mr Aaron Patrick, Senior Correspondent at the Australian Financial Review and also an RUSI New South Wales member. Aaron's area at the Finn Review is politics, business and economics, so he's well suited to speak on some of the topics that were Sir Herman's area of expertise. Aaron has also written for the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Aaron is also the author of four books on Australian politics, Downfall, How the Labor Party Ripped Itself Apart, Credlin and Co, A Relationship That Determined the Fate of a Government, The Surprise Party, How the Coalition Came Back from the Brink, and Ego, Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberal Party's Civil War. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Aaron Patrick to the podium. Thanks, Ron, and, and thanks everyone for being here today. So 2023 is the year of the rabbit, which signifies peace, prosperity, and longevity. Instead, we got war and economic turmoil. There was a bit of longevity though, but it wasn't particularly constructive. We saw the oldest US president in history determined to seek another term, despite clear evidence of cognitive decline against what now appears to be a likely opponent only a couple of years younger, who was indicted this year, raising the prospect, which is being taken seriously in the US, 
that the next president of the United States might be a convicted felon serving his sentence. In Russia, the man who has been president or prime minister for 23 years was pursued a war that may eventually destroy him. In Israel, the prime minister there, one of the most dominant political figures in the whole Middle East, didn't foresee a war which could end him too. I want to begin, though, with um, what I consider the most important event of the year, which is obviously the war in Ukraine, and my personal plan to help the Ukrainians win. In February, I did some research, and I learned that a plan under, um, uh, 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 under the previous government to sell up to 46 of Australia's FA-18 fighter bombers to a US, US training company had fallen through. Now, given that the Ukrainian Air Force had fewer than 100 uh, MiG-29s and SU-27s at the start of the war, um, I argued in a column that Australia could simply give the FA-18s to the Ukrainians, which would be the equivalent of a mid-sized air force. And I felt that they were, they'd be pretty good because they were designed for um, short takeoffs and landings, aircraft carriers obviously, and they had very, they had very sturdy undercarriage, which would be pretty good for the um, rough and ready Ukrainian runways. Um, I also argued that Defence Minister Richard Miles and Foreign Minister Penny Wong could make themselves significant international players by um, stepping up and handing over the, the Hornets. Now the idea got a bit of attention around the world after the Prime Minister's office leaked to my paper that it might be open to the idea. Unfortunately, it wasn't particularly popular in Kyiv, um, which is more interested in the F-16s, which are really an equivalent kind of aircraft, and um, which are being retired in large numbers, in the thousands, across the world, in particular Western Europe. So the Danes and Dutch stepped in, promised the Zelensky some F-16s, and got the glory, and what was probably the only chance of my life to influence a war was lost. Such is the life of a journalist. Like many others, I watched the Ukrainian spring offensive with high hopes and a Twitter account. Never before had so much information about combat become available or been available to the public so quickly. A new glorious phase of conflict analysis bloomed. Unlike the, the Western-trained battalions that smashed into the Russian defences that had been built while the Ukrainians were, been, were entrained by us, and other members of the Western Alliance. It took about a month for the world to realise that there was going to be no breakthrough. Our hopes were too high. Perhaps the expectations that um, Ukrainian soldiers given one or two months training on equipment they'd never used before, using tactics which were alien to their armed forces, could be successful against a numerically superior force which had many months to dig in. Even a mutiny by the most effective element of the Russian army, or the Russian armed forces, the Wagner Group, and a, and a, and a, and a rebellious march on Moscow had little impact on the front lines. For all their faults militarily, the, the Russians had the resources and the will and the manpower to defend. On June 25th, I interviewed a man called Kyle Wilson, who was probably Australia's top expert on Russia. He'd run the Russia desk at the Office of National Assessments for many years. And he said to me, I quote, history suggests that Mr. Prigozhin's days are numbered. I thought it was a pretty good quote, but I thought, nah, that's overly dramatic. So I didn't use it in the headline, which was a missed opportunity because he turned out to be exactly right. It would have been fascinating to see how Donald Trump would have handled the war if he had been president, and we may still get to see that happen. In March, he was indicted in New York over payments to a form, former pornographic actress, Stormy Daniels. I'm sure Sir Herman Black would have had a much higher quality or, or uh, uh, much more respectable um, speeches, but it's an important part of history. This was followed by another indictment in Georgia. There's the photograph. Um, 
In March, Trump was indicted um, in New York over payments. This was followed by another indictment in the state of Georgia and federally for allegedly trying to overturn the 2020 election and allegedly taking confidential documents from the White House. Three trials have been scheduled for next year. Now, a month ago, I went to the US um, for a work trip to California and Texas. And I, I lived in the US for a while. I, was, I studied there and I was a correspondent for my paper there, but it had been some time. America today is a strange place. For one of the rare times in my life, I felt unsafe walking through the center of a large city, which was downtown Los Angeles. The homelessness and the drug abuse, people openly smoking drugs on footpaths in the middle of a big city, I found really quite confronting. There was a strong sense of social decay. Middle class Americans I spoke to cited personal safety, safety as a serious concern. Now this was less so in Austin, Texas, where I was told that the reason there is so little road rage is the high level of gun ownership in the state. I decided to take my partner, who was an Australian, who was working over there for Amazon, to a gun range. And she'd never shot a firearm before. And um, she decided she preferred a Glock to an AR-15. Um, I've shot before, I've never shot a pistol before, and I found it's quite hard to focus on the target when you're gauging in rapid firing. Some of you probably already know this. On October the 7th, hundreds, perhaps thousands of Hamas fighters carrying assault rifles and other weapons crossed the border into Israel on motorbikes and foot and killed some more than 1,200 people, most of them civilians. We know now that, um, that the Israel border corps um, had been watching strange activity in Gaza for at least six weeks beforehand, according to Haaretz. And at one point, the Hamas had created a scale model of an Israeli observation post and had practiced attacking it using drones. They also built a scale model of a Mokava, I think, is that how you pronounce it, tank, and practiced attacking it and capturing the crew. Now, the, um, the border corps um, is, has a large a number of young female um, soldiers who do the surveillance. And they sit there all day just watching what's going on. And they apparently passed this strange behaviour up the chain of command and were ignored. On, the, on October the 7th, um, at a kibbutz, I think about a kilometre from the border, um, Hamas stormed one of these observation centres. Uh, none of the young women had guns um, and they basically slaughtered them. Um, which I think was pretty pretty sad, obviously. Um, down the border with Egypt, there were uh, three tanks, three Israeli tanks, manned by all women crews. Now, the Israelis say they're their only country in the world who has um, all female tank crews, obviously in the Australian Armed Forces. All, all jobs are open to women. And there have been female tank commanders, although I don't believe there have been any full female tank crews. Anyway, these young women, I saw video of them, they literally look like they are university students. They are 20 years old, they got in their tanks, they drove up, they fought the whole way, they fought for 17 hours. They killed hundreds of enemy soldiers, they used machine guns, they'd never been in combat before, they'd been placed on the Egyptian border because the IDF felt that was the safest place. They'd then all male tank units were up on the Golan Heights and on, and on the Beirut border. Um, at one point, one of the um, um, tank crew was describing to an Israeli television channel um, how she literally ran over a couple of her mass fighters. They said all this in a very matter-of-fact way. And to me, that brought home the obvious brutality of war, but also the professionalism and the motivation of the IDF. In the entirely predictable retaliation that followed, um, it was remarkable to my, to my eyes 
how, how many people in the West didn't accept Israel's legal and moral right to self-defence? I chose not to watch the 41-minute video Israel created of its citizens being killed, which was shown in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. But I did see one video that surprised me, and it was doctors in Gaza holding up the body of a dead infant at a press conference in a very crowded hospital room. We all feel terrible for the deaths of the Palestinian people, but I think it's worth stating the obvious. Israel does not kill children because it wants them dead. Those children die because they are, obviously through no fault of their own, in the presence of, or close to, people Israel considers military targets. To not those people, students, who've been ripping down posters of Israeli hostages, including outside my office at nine, not consider that Hamas has a moral responsibility for initiating the war. One example of the information war that is being fought was the explosion at the Al Ali Hospital in Gaza in October 17th. History says that Australians actually used this hospital during World War I, although I couldn't find any photographs of Australian soldiers there. Anyway, based on allegations by Hamas medical authorities, media outlets around the world reported on October 17th that an Israeli missile strike on the hospital had killed 500 people. Now in Canberra, there was a 26-year-old guy called Nathan Rusa who was watching this on Twitter. He's a civilian analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Within 24 hours, Rusa, Rusa was pretty much able to conclusively demonstrate there was no way that 500 people could have practically died in that attack. He, he, he obtained satellite image of the, of the area where the deaths took place. He created a little um, Sims-like graphic which showed the number of people that had to be present in that space for them to die on the assumption that everyone died. There are no people who survived wounded. This is at 6.30 at night. And then he looked at photographs of the courtyard at the hospital where the people died and he pointed out that within tens of metres of the epicentre of the explosion there were roof tiles in place which was inconsistent with a large explosion you would think. I had a look at it too and I saw that there were trees in the courtyard with their leaves still on them. He came out he was a, he, and he was, a, he was among a number of open source analysts before the Israelis had a chance to conclusively explain their position, convinced the world that this was not an attack by the IDF. It was actually a, f a rocket fired from a cemetery in Gaza that had not made it to Israel and had hit the hospital. So as abuse poured in to Rusa, this Aussie guy, 26-year-old guy, who'd been a, a security study student at ANU on Twitter, he said, now it seems that the facts don't really matter. And I note this week that Human Rights Watch, which when I was a younger man was the epitome of objective research about war, only this week came out in support of the argument that it wasn't the Israelis who'd attacked them a position that, that even was disputed by the New York Times on the day. Facts do matter, even inconvenient ones. And those interested in international affairs are now fortunate to have access to analysis that was previously only available to decision makers, perhaps even a few years ago. That makes it harder for governments to lie to us, although they continue to do so. In London, I once met the now deceased Australian journalist Philip Knightley, 
In 1975, Knightley published a book called The First Casualty, which describes how war, war journalism is used to manipulate and is manipulated. Knightley told me that when he started writing the book, his initial concern is that he wouldn't have enough material to fill a book. It turned out he didn't, he, he, he needn't have worried. He had more material than he could ever use. And that book became a classic, became one of the defining studies of the manipulation of public opinion during wartime. Which brings me to a situation that happened this year at home. A former army lawyer, a major, called David McBride, two weeks ago, pleaded guilty to stealing federal government documents and unauthorised disclosure of them. He gave hundreds of documents to the ABC journalist Dan Oakes and Sam Clark in what became known as the Afghan Files in 2017. Now, McBride was arrested in 2018, and this year there has been a significant public relations campaign to convince Attorney General Mark Davis to use his powers to halt McBride's prosecution on the grounds that he was a whistleblower and he acted in the national interest. His lawyers cited the Nuremberg trials as one of the reasons why he shouldn't be prosecuted or found guilty. Among those supporting McBride and putting pressure on Dreyfus was Human Rights Watch, Transparency International, the Media Entertainment Arts Alliance, the Australian Centre for International Justice, the Community and Public Sector Union, Peter Grester, who was held in jail in Egypt for over a year, and Kerry O'Brien, one of the most respected ABC journalists in the country, all complained that a whistleblower was being prosecuted for exposing war crimes. I spoke to one of McBride's lawyers, Mark Davis, former television reporter, and he confirmed what I had read but wasn't sure whether it could be true. Was it McBride's stated intention was not to expose war crimes. He was to expose what he regarded as the unfair prosecution of Australian soldiers who had legally killed Afghans. <coughs> the documents, well, I'll get to that in a second. McBride described in his memoir, which was out in the last month, The Nature of Honour, one such incident. In 2013, the SAS captured three men on a mission with the ANA, the Afghan National Army. They had to fly these guys back to base in helicopters for interrogation. And part of the process of transferring the prisoners to a helicopter involved changing their handcuff arrangements from being in front to being behind. So the soldiers had to cut the plastic handcuffs and, and apply new ones. It's meant to be a two-man job. One person cuts the cuffs and the other person stands guard. Stands guard. But an SAS corporal called, who was named Beachy in the book, uh, for reasons that aren't clear, um, well, for, to expedite matters, decided to do this procedure on his own in, in a small cow shed, watched by an interpreter. As he cut off the cuffs, the Afghan man grabbed his rifle. They wrestled for the rifle for about 10 years. The corporal was unable to pull the rifle away from him, but was able to point the muzzle at, his, at him and kill him with three shots. Now, for reasons that aren't, aren't clear, the death wasn't immediately reported, and apparently none of the other Australian soldiers present witnessed it. McBride was the lawyer at the SAS base, I assume it was Tarancot, um, where the guys were based. And so he describes in the book being summoned to his commanding officer's office and being told of the death. Um, and also being told that what McBride calls the generals in Canberra had decided the corporal would be investigated for murder. McBride had to break the news to the guy, to the, to the Australian soldier. He makes it clear in the book he disagreed with the decision. 
But what he didn't mention in the book, but what I read in the Afghan files, was that on what appears to be McBride's advice, the SAS commander refused to hand over the firearm to the investigators. And he'd also said the weapon had been used subsequent to the, to the death and therefore wouldn't be of any use to them. And also that their warrant to take the rifle was invalid. So it must have been a hell of an interesting conversation out there in Afghanistan. The investigators then apparently decided they were going to take the weapon by force. Um, now this SAS soldier has never been charged and only one Australian soldier has been charged with war crimes in Afghanistan. But on, on the eve of his trial, McBride gave an interview to Channel 10's The Project and where he talked about what his motives were. And his argument was um, that the army wanted to investigate or prosecute innocent men when it realised that it had, it had promoted, in, in a public relations sense, dubious soldiers or, so, or a soldier. So he said, we became so enamoured with the media idea that if someone was good looking and a good talker, even if it was evidence to say they had murdered someone, sorry, that's Rusa, even if it was evidence to say they, they had murdered someone, this is McBride, we were talking them up, talking them up, and then we realised we must have backed the wrong people. Then we said, shit, we've got to get some non-entities, make scapegoats of them. So I thought, what the hell is he talking about? And I thought, he's talking about a certain VC winner. So this is a... I've never been in the army. I guess most, most of you blokes probably have. I don't know if that's how bureaucracies work. But this is a pretty astounding allegation to make. So the New South Wales, the uh, ACT Supreme Court decided that um, McBride wouldn't have the, um, the, uh, the national interest defence available to him. He couldn't use that as an excuse to give documents to journalists. Um, and he was unable to claim that defence. So what have we learnt about 2023? We're just taking a step, step back. It's been a war of violence, and it's been a year of violence and war and disruption and economic turmoil. We've learnt that trade doesn't guarantee peace nor prosperity. We've learnt that nations should always be prepared for war. We've learnt that socially divided nations like the US are more likely to suffer urban, de urban decay. That's all true, but I think there's another way to look at 2023 in a more optimistic light. I think perhaps in the future we will come back and we'll look at this year as a turning point for the West. Look at the war in Ukraine. They're quoting eminent military strategist Lawrence Friedman. He points out that not one element of Putin's strategy has worked. The energy crunch that was supposed to force you, 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 you European governments to their knees, not the attacks on the Ukrainian energy infrastructure that was supposed to make it collapse, sap its will to fight, not the numerous offensives that, according to British intelligence, are costing the Russians 970 casualties a day. None of these things have worked. After the first, weeks of, first few weeks of war, Russia had a presence in more than a quarter of the Ukraine, now it's down to about 18%. Look at the Middle East. Despite it's a normal, despite it being surprised, Israel has now decided to eliminate Hamas, its primary military, its closest military opponent. It will almost certainly be successful, at least in the short term that will redefine the Arab-Israeli conflict. It may even be a step towards a two-state solution. But if the Israelis are successful, if the Western democracies continue to back Israel and the Ukraine, if we can get our own house in order economically, then this year may turn out to be a lot better than it seems. Thank you very much.
Beachy article that was in the um, Australian Financial Review that was an extract. So much good stuff is published in that uh, newspaper, analysis of the wars, etc. Um, I wanted to ask an entirely different uh, question than what you've covered, and that is the South Pacific. And the announcement by Prime Minister Albanese in the Cook Islands at the South Pacific Forum that some form of security pact had been negotiated with Tuvalu. And that on that basis we would respond if that pact. You mean a Chinese security pact? Um, you mean China Tuvalu or Australia Tuvalu? No, Tuvalu. Uh, yeah. Um, the Prime Minister announced that we would come to their aid right. if there was a threat against that island state. Now, that is a, a military commitment, and it seems to just have gone through and gone past, and no one questioned it. I, I know of no other similar example, either than the commitment of forces overseas. So are you questioning um, why we haven't had a bigger debate in Australia about what appears on the face of it to be an open-ended a security guarantee to a Pacific nation, which is a big step in our potential foreign commitments. The question is, the answer is, I don't know. Um, but it sounds like a pretty good point to me. As a journalist and an editor, I would make two observations, which is... I think most Australians don't appreciate that we are essentially a superpower in the South Pacific and that, um, and that we have the potential to have huge influence there. Obviously that's something that policy makers are completely across, but I don't think it reaches the average the consciousness of the nation. And part of that is because of our sort of Eurocentric press, history, focus. Not many of us have been to Tuvalu either. Um, but I agree with you that it does seem to be something that was worthy of considerable, and is worthy of considerable attention. I'm sorry if I can't give you a better answer than that, but it's just not my area of expertise. Yeah, good day, Lieutenant Colonel William Wolf. Uh, I previously served in Strategic Planning Division for four years. I can advise everyone, I think it's important to know, that this security treaty with Tuvalu is nothing new. We have lots of those similar security treaties with most of the South West Pacific countries. They are at a fairly low level to deal with civil strife, civil wars, coups, uh, needs for special forces to be deployed to rescue hostages, etc. And a big chunk of them was relating to humanitarian assistance after things like uh, tsunamis and earthquakes, etc. Mm -hmm. And part of it's also to do with countering criminal activity, including money laundering, etc. Now, at the higher level for you know a, an invasion, say, of Tuvalu, not that I would understand why anyone would want to do it. It's purely at the level of, like the ANZUS Treaty, we will talk. It is not a formal commitment to deploy forces. However, having said that, on the rare occasions we have actually done that was to the Solomons, where on two occasions within 24 hours we've had a ready company group there to stop or slow down the civil strife. So I hope that answers that question. <coughs> Happy for anyone to come and talk to me about it afterwards. I thank you. And I do agree they should get a lot more debate in the public environment. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I'd like to go back to the Middle East. Uh, the two state solution, of course, has been around since 1947 uh, or later, um, and uh, it hasn't uh, moved an inch in that time. And the fundamental problem, of course, is that who guarantees Israel's security in a two-state solution? Who's to stop the new Palestinian state teaming up, as Lebanon has done, with Iran and other hostile states? Now, as far as I'm aware, nobody's come up with a reasonable plan that would allow the solution to go 
go ahead and at the same time guarantee Israel's uh, security. So have you got any ideas or heard any ideas about how this dilemma might be solved? Look, I haven't turned my, my mind to solving the Israel-Palestinian fight. <laughs> I, maybe I should. Um, no. No, I don't. I don't. Um, I asked um, two weeks ago Dave Sharma about the environment there. Um, you probably all know who he is. He was the Aussie ambassador to Israel and now he's just been chosen as a Liberal senator from New South Wales. And David made two points which I found particularly interesting. He said um, the attack has uh, unified politically Israeli society. He says even the far left, Netanyahu's greatest opponents are enemies. Uh, completely support his military response. But he also said Netanyahu's uh, credibility has, in his mind, um, been eliminated and that um, uh, he does not see any way in which Israeli society will, allow, will, will, allow, will allow Netanyahu to remain in power after a limited period of time because I hold him responsible for... Um, the attack. Uh, Chris Skinner, uh, Brucey. Um, while we may all uh, be uh, greatly concerned about the Middle East and Ukraine, surely would you agree that a more important factor during this year is the Defence Strategic Review and included within that the uh, intent that we uh, deter or uh, 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 oppose uh, any strategic threat to Australia further from our shores than maybe it was previously the case. Would you care? I'm sure. Sure. Look, I, 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 I didn't mention the Defence Strategic Review in part because I didn't feel there's anything I can tell this group about it that it doesn't already know, given the level of expertise in this room. Um, I would, putting aside the, putting aside the, uh, the fence element of it, I would, because I wrote about this in my last book, I, I've asked people to look at the quite remarkable, enduring political consensus in Australia towards the defence of the continent. So, AUKUS, which is essentially, you know, one of the foundations of our of our national security, or it will be in the next couple of decades, came out of the least successful Prime Minister politically, probably of the post-war period, which was Scott Morrison. And, um, and I wrote a book about this, and you know, for all Scott Morrison's faults, the C faults, he was able to convince... Um, a superpower and Britain, superpower to share some of its most sensitive technologies with us in secret, a deal he did in secret, and able to obtain a political consensus with a party who at its very core is completely opposed to nuclear energy and, and nuclear weapons. So there isn't, I don't think there's anything enlightening I can say about to you about the Defence Strategic Review. But I do think that um, we have been blessed, in a sense, with very good defence bureaucrats and also, I think, politicians who have reached, been prepared to reach a consensus about one of the most profound national security decisions made in my lifetime. That's not yours, but in mine. Well, I'm sorry if I'm avoiding your question, but I, I don't want to just waffle about the, about the DSR. If I may follow that up. Yep. Um, it did receive bipartisan support. It's very important. But the, the key that I was looking for you to comment on is the idea of defending Australia further from our shores, a, a sort of impactful projection and words of that effect. Look, I, I, I follow Tony Abbott on this, on this matter really as well. 
And, you know, essentially the, the nuclear subs are out there to participate in the defence of Taiwan and so forth. And, um, and he's worked very hard, I think, to help, help Australians realise the importance of defending Taiwan and the significance of our relationship with Japan. And, um, and his argument is, which has, managed, which has convinced me, which is if Taiwan falls, that's it for US influence in the Pacific. He said that is the end of, I wouldn't say hegemony, but predominance, I'm not sure what the term is, of American, American superiority in the Pacific, in our sea lanes, our primary sea lanes. And so to me that was a really powerful and convincing argument that, that Tony, that Mr Abbott's made. You know, and I see that the nuclear submarines and the, and the long-range missiles, and I guess... Uh, I guess the new aircraft are all part of that mission. So, as a, as a complete amateur, seems to be a pretty persuasive argument. Now, I know I have a colleague at work, uh, James Curran, who's worked in the public service, he's got a PhD, and he's a he's an academic, and you know, and he's more of a uh, um, he's a less of a force project projection kind of guy, if I could say so. And I disagree with him. Michael Howe, uh, I'm a past president of Ruthie. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to talk about a generational gap with the use of media. Um, when I look at younger people, I'm surprised, like you commented, about how many people believe what I'll call a Hamas version of what's going on rather than the Israeli version of going on. That's a preface to my question or comment. Would you mind commenting on the fact that Younger generational people don't watch the ABC. They don't read newspapers as a, as a broad statement. They rely on social media. And, and in that sense, can you comment on the role of the media as it is beginning to affect generations and the way that that is perhaps shaping our view as to what this, in this particular case, the Israeli Hamas conflict, but it's really a wider is, issue than that. Is, Would you mind commenting on that generational gap? Well, of course, Mike, I'd love to. Oh, look, it's a really profound matter for, for, for me and my industry. And I remember um, as a very young journalist, well, I think it was 1994, and I was in the newsroom in Melbourne of a newspaper where I worked, and I got a phone call on a Sunday morning. And someone said... Is it true that the Prime Minister of Israel has been assassinated? So, can someone remind me who, who that was? I think, sorry? No, Rabin. And, um, and I said, I don't know, but I'll have a look. And um, I can't, re can't remember. No, I just looked up the, the wire. I can't remember what I saw. But I mean, you just make the point that in, 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 when Rabin was assassinated, an ordinary person had to reach out to a journalist who had privileged access to information. And as I've described, described today, you know, all of us can look on what's happening at Andivka and find out what the, where the line is, you know, from two days ago, which is something you know, previously is only available to the intelligence services. So there's been a profound shift. And I have two teenagers, and they don't watch what, we, what I call linear television. Um, they... Oh, I've had conversations where they said, what's Channel 7? <laughs> and, um, and, and my son's first exposure to US politics and Trump was through a computer game called Minecraft, where people, where other children were talking about it. So, yeah, no, it is a profound shift in where humans obtain their information. And we all probably grew up reading newspapers, you know, print newspapers, and um, those print newspapers are going to die with us, unfortunately, because I love, I love print newspapers. Now, the second part of your question, if I understand correctly, is a lot more complicated and hard to, to answer, which is how is that shift in consumption affecting attitudes? And, and I don't know, and it may be profoundly, maybe not at all. It may be the contest of ideas is going on in a different format, in a different medium, media, but there's still a contest of ideas and it's still bitterly fought. So I'm not convinced that 
social media is changing our children dramatically to us. Because I, I and my, you know, my main reason for saying this conversation is my own children, because I see them profoundly shaped by their, by their upbringing and their social environment and by their parents and the values they have at home. And I, um, and I see, and we all, uh, we, you know, most of us probably see the, um, the, the ferociousness of the debate around the world about what's, ha- what's happening in this photo, celebrating, you know, essentially the death of that tank crew. But I'm not convinced that social media is, is changing those attitudes. I think we're just hearing them. And I think, you know, in the old days... People would sit around a barbecue and talk about politics and slag off the politicians they dislike, and now they go and do it on Twitter, and you just are aware of it. But I don't know that's any different. Um, my name is Malcolm Fraser. Um, I do. Mr. Patrick, I do thank you for a most informative and hopeful uh, speech, and also for your emphasis on the importance of truth. And our Aboriginal First Nations people talk about the importance of truth telling. Uh, and I think that's something we all need to uh, apply. And I'm also grateful for all the ADF does <coughs> to keep us safe and to help us in emergencies. I actually did two years in the reserve many years ago, and I regard them as two of the most significant and informative years that I've had. Uh, I'm currently a member of the Marigal Peace Group, uh, but I'm not representing them today. My question is, would national security be further improved if the if there was a properly financed and resourced Peace Corps that young people could join, which is adequately trained, adequately paid, where they would be able to uh, provide aid in Australia and overseas? Thanks for your feedback, Malcolm. I've never thought about a Peace Corps, and I, I assume from your background that you're in favour of one. Um, so maybe I'll take that as, as, as advocacy for one. Um, and I think it's definitely uh, probably, a, probably an idea worth considering. Uh, my two children participating in cadets at school, and they get a, and they get a hell of a lot out of it. And... Um, and, and I remember my daughter, she was 16 going on her... She goes to an all-girls school and she goes on her um, first cadet camp um, up, um, up in Hunter Valley and the teacher comes up to her and says, listen, there's been a problem. <coughs> Some girls have dropped out, they haven't turned up. At the moment, you're assigned to a, to a uh, unit of um, where all the uh, leaders... NCOs, I guess you'd call them, um, a male. Um, and there's probably only one other female student with you. Are you okay with that? Now, you know, we're all, we're all aware just how important it is and how uh, the emphasis these days on gender and gender balance. And so that's what a well-meaning teacher was trying to do. And her and a friend said, oh, well, look, we'll give it a shot, you know. We'll see what these boys are like from this from this all-boys private school. She said by the end of it, they were the nicest guys she'd ever met. She said they were absolutely lovely, they treated them with respect, they were good fun, they became good friends. So it was a very enriching experience for her, and I think there's no reason why you couldn't have a similar experience in a peace group or, or a religious group or any or a political group or any other kind of group. I think any kind of uh, community contribution... Um, is incredibly worthwhile for children, for adults too. John Hitchin, RUSI, New South Wales. The recent HMS Toowoomba incident seems to be some playgrounds. Jim King's ship pinned and injured some of our Navy personnel, yet the government seems to have done very little to stand up for our service people. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, are there any submariners in the room? Any experts? No? There is? Oh, look, I, I don't know what kind of damage that a sonar pulse does to you if you're underwater. Um, must have, can't be nothing. 
if it got to the prime ministerial level, struck me that it was incredibly unfortunate timing for the prime minister because he'd just gone to Beijing and declared peace in our time with, with Xi, and then suddenly, you know, the PLA Navy didn't get the memo. So uh, it struck me as um, as a as a great example of why we have to be so wary of the Chinese, because you know they're a ruthless, non-democratic state um, who will always pursue their own interests and don't share the same values or view of what the global order should be. And we can go and talk about pandas, you know, with the Secretary of the Communist Party, the CPP, but it doesn't mean at some point Chinese soldiers will be killing our soldiers and vice versa. Fred Shorten, um, thank you for the optimistic end to your speech. Um, I'd just ask you to comment on what I see as extreme polarisation of US society, which was not there in the 70s and 80s. You could be a Democrat or a Republican and be in the centre. No, you can't. You're either hard left or hard right. And the impact on the world of Trump becoming president and handing Ukraine over to Russia without, without um, prosecuting Russia for its war crimes, because that's going to be part of the settlement. I'm just concerned about what that does to Europe and what that does to would-be aggressors and dictators around the world. Well, that is, that is a um, pretty uh, important question. What happens to the West if Donald Trump becomes its leader? Um, and in a way, it's, I think it's... Look, just, just, just having spent a career trying to predict things, <laughs> it's amazing just how unpredictable the future really is and how unpredictable people are. And, um, and, and Trump, for all his incredible faults as a person, um, will be constrained by the institutions of America, which remain pretty strong. So a US president doesn't have complete unilateral power in America for obvious reasons. Look, I, the, the chief of the, of the general staff of the, of the US forces said, said a couple of weeks ago, he was asked, you know, why are we spending all this money in Ukraine? And he said, well... He said, we've degraded 50% of our primary geostrategic competitor with 5% of our budget. And it was a pretty uh, strong argument, I thought. Um, so Trump can be persuaded. Trump can be sort of controlled by norms, political, governmental norms, legal norms, not entirely, obviously. But I think the notion that if Trump is elected... Um, Ukraine is left on its own is not something you can be certain about. And you already see the Europeans perhaps fearing a Trump presidency increasing their commitments too. So I'm still optimistic. I'm still optimistic about Western support for Ukraine persisting um, even under a Trump presidency. I want to have, Aaron, I yes. want to have your touch on where Prime Minister Albanese stands now and what his political uh, opportunities and future might be in 2024. Sure. OK, well, does anyone think Albanese's had a good year? Raise your hand. Look, um, I, was there, I was there on election night at the, at the... I can't remember where it was. It was in Marrickville, his victory party and speech. And that, you know everyone was they were pretty happy as you can expect. And he got up, and one of the, the clearest things I remember from that night was him saying, "We're going to we're going to have a voice. We're going to implement it." I'm like, "A voice? What's a voice? I don't even know what it was." And I went back and I looked for his speeches, and I'm like, "Oh no, he had mentioned it before, but normally it's like number number seven, number eight." 
I didn't realise was going to be the most significant policy proposal of his first full of his first year, right? And um, what a what an incredible political miscalculation that was. And oh, look, I've I've defended Albanese in the sense that at least he is a man who is enacting the policies that are that are that are who he is, where he comes from, and what he's always advocated for. I think we're getting what we bought when it comes to the Prime Minister, which is um, an inner city government interventionist, you know, who wants to shape society and and implement these progressive causes. So Australians voted for it and they're getting it. Australians don't seem to like that. Australians seem to be more worried about the cost of their energy and their fuel and their interest, their mortgage, mortgage payments. So he has, um, he has, he has destroyed is too strong a word, but he has severely undermined his political authority in Australia. He's basically spent his political capital. And, and the incredible thing is you look at those news poll charts of the um, popularity, the leader popularity, and his, his chart or his curve almost mirrors exactly Morrison's. Okay? His decline in popularity because people forget these days that Morrison was extremely popular in the early years of the pandemic or the early year of the pandemic. You know, very high popularity ratings because he was seen to be pretty effective. And so um, <coughs> Albanese now goes goes into an, envir- an economic environment which is incredibly hostile to him. And he is trying to implement a very complicated and interventionist energy policy, which, um, as far as I can tell, they're trying to not disclose how much it's going to cost. And um, you know, there'll become a, there may may come a point where Australians say we're sick of fair prices going up, and why are we spending twelve billion in the snowy building a couple of water pools to to you know to generate to what we call a battery, the snowy two point and all the other projects when um, when taxes are going up and prices are going up. So I think. Um, Albanese faces a very, very dangerous period up to the next election. Um, and you have Peter Dutton, who was roundly criticised by elements of the media, including in my organisation, for opposing The Voice, who has now clearly been demonstrated to happen to have done something that 60% of the population agrees with. You know, so would demonstrate that the lead of the opposition... Um, Ain't no fool. I can just use this. Aaron? Hi, Theo. Hi, Theo. <laughs> thank you for coming today. On behalf of RUSI and everyone here today, I'd like to thank you for the talk. Um, the Preparing for today, I actually looked up Wikipedia to see what were the major events for 2023. And even just for Australia, it was multiple pages long. So this is one of the hardest lectures you can give and feel good, feel that you've done the right thing. So thank you very much. We appreciate what you've done. Um, and uh, you're now a, an official honorary member of RUSI for 12 months. Congratulations. Thanks, thank you. Hope you renew next year. Thank you. Thank you.